Welcome to Act 3, the podcast where we explore how to thoughtfully shape the rest of our lives. I'm your host, Kara Gray. This podcast is sponsored by Good Morning Freedom, my retirement coaching service where I help executives and professionals plan their Act 3. For more information, stay tuned until the end. Today, I welcome Connie Lindsay to the podcast. Connie is the former executive vice president and head of corporate social responsibility at Northern Trust Chicago. She was the first African-American woman to be named executive vice president in the history of the firm. Prior to her retirement in November 2021, she was responsible for the design and implementation of the global corporate social responsibility, community development, and investments and Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Strategy for Northern Trust and the development of goals, policies, and programs appropriate to the brand and business unit strategies. Connie is a former National Board President of Girl Scouts of the USA. She joined the Girl Scouts Board in 2005 and was elected National Board President, the highest-ranking volunteer of this 2.5 million member organization in 2008, and 2011 for three-year terms. Connie serves on several civic and charitable boards to include the Chicago Community Trust, WTTW Board of Trustees, Leadership Greater Chicago, McCormick Theological Seminary, United Church Funds, Obama Foundation Inclusion Council, Chicago Urban League, and American Cancer Society. She has been recognized for her leadership contributions by the Anti-Defamation League's Woman of Achievement Award, Chicago Defender of Women of Excellence Award, Chicago United's Business Leaders of Color Award, Leadership of Greater Chicago's Distinguished Fellow Award, National Diversity Council's Most Powerful and Influential Women Award, Women's Bar Association of Illinois Advocacy Award, YWCA's Outstanding Leader in the Community Leadership, and the Chicago Urban League Humanitarian Award. Connie, I welcome you to the podcast. Thank you. So good to see you. For, I'm, so, I'm so excited to have you here. So if anybody goes to Connie's LinkedIn profile, she talks about rewirement, not retirement. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that direction and what it means for you at this stage of your life. Well, once again, thank you for having me. Um, that term I learned about way back in probably 2007, Jerry Sadler wrote a book called Don't Retire, Rewire. He co-authored it with another person. And that long ago, I thought that makes sense because for me, a life of purpose means, you know, how am I doing things that are uh, making a positive difference in the world? That's the Girl Scout in me, Kara. <laughs> it's more of the make, how do I make the world a better place? And so um, that really resonated with me. And that became a focal point to say, I get it. When, I, when it's my time to shift and pivot to my next in my life, the next season, that's going to be the theme. I love it. And um, I do want to as I do on each one of these podcasts, backtrack a little bit mm -hmm. and talk about your journey at Northern Trust and the transition from that career to your now rewired life. Tell us a little bit like about your career and how your days were and all the craziness and how many hours you worked and <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> all and the details. Had, <laughs> sure. I actually had a career before Northern Trust. Um, I actually started my career at Wisconsin Bell in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, where AT&T owned all of the Bell System companies. And at divestiture in 1983, when Judge Green signed that order, I then was asked to come to Chicago and work for what was then going to become the holding company known as Ameritech. So that is how I got to Chicago from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, after graduating college and working at Ameritech and came here to help set up uh, part of the finance uh, department for Ameritech Corporation. So that was how I came to Chicago. And then in 1993, um, had been doing work with a lot of the folks at Northern Trust, uh, putting together some of the financial work that Ameritech needed to have done, whether it was a revolving credit facility, banking services, and got to know a few people at Northern Trust. And when I thought about what the next shift in my career would be, you know, I certainly had not thought about banking. And I'll go back even further to say, 
um, I, in undergraduate school, I interned as an engineering student at the local utility company, the local electric company in my hometown of Milwaukee. So I had been in regulated industry and utilities for most of my life. And so as I thought about moving away from Ameritech, the telephone company, moving into banking was the last thing on my mind, another regulated industry. But because I had good relationships and there was an opportunity that I thought could help me grow my skills as a leader, as a financial services professional, um, it was a great move and one of the best decisions I think I made to uh, move over to Northern Trust back in 1993. And that's where I spent the next 28 years with it. I could say I started my career at six, but we know the math wouldn't math. Um, <laughs> And so I uh, spent the next 28 years there, started in um, product management marketing, working on um, different kinds of banking product products for um, the, the firm's business, large corporate clients, then worked in the wealth management business, worked in operations and technology. So I had a number of leadership roles, progressive leadership roles that allowed me not only to develop my skills and really stretch and, and, and understand more about the business, but also then to give me the opportunity to, to navigate through the, the culture and, and do the kinds of things that both matter to me as an individual, but certainly help fulfill the corporation's overarching strategy to our clients uh, that the firm served. You broke through some ceilings there. Pretty much. Some of them were titanium, but you know, we <laughs> so, some didn't break, but there's at least I hope a crack that I left there for sure. Yeah, I believe it. So you have been and probably still are on the board of several civic and charitable boards. Tell us about that involvement. Has it evolved since you've rewired or are you still involved with the same organizations? Are you pursuing other opportunities? Tell us about that work. Well, there's, and I've always been a person who's civically engaged. Uh, during high school, I was an inroads student and the inroads program way years ago was an opportunity for um, students of color to have, have the opportunity to work in large organizations. And so that service orientation that I have, the notion of giving back and lifting as I climb, that was born in me. And even as a little girl growing up in Milwaukee as a Girl Scout, all of those kinds of values that I learned as a young person, those have stayed with me. And so I've been fortunate in my corporate life and throughout my corporate life to have what I called an undivided life in that my service to people was somehow connected to the work that I did in the corporation. And the culture of Northern Trust is one that all of the executives and all of the partners, as we call our employees, were expected to be able to give back to the community. So I had the good fortune of being able to have those two things intersect with the support of the, of the, of the corporation, but taking those with me as I moved into rewirement. So several of the organizations that I'm engaged, engaged with today, some are new, but there are a few that I had been working with um, before I left corporate, serving as the co-chair of the Inclusion Council for the Obama Foundation. That was before mm -hmm. I left corporate. Girl Scouts, I served as national president concomitantly while working in my corporate career. And, and there's a couple others that I've added on, but I'd say this one thing, Kara, it's that um, we know we can volunteer and engage in a lot of things, but what's most important to me is am I effective in those roles? And it costs money to be on nonprofit boards, right? Those are boards for which you're raising money and you're expected to donate money. So being mindful that I'm not um, overboarded, as it were, and that yeah. each of those entities are true to who I am as a person and that they align with the kinds of things that I think are important in society and in our world. What percentage of your time are you dedicating to those causes at this point? Right now, I'd say it's it's almost 50% of my time because I wow. chair the board of McCormick Theological Seminary um, and I serve um, on several committees on the American Cancer Society. And I still sit on the board of leadership Greater Chicago, which is an amazing organization. I'm a fellow since 2001 with Leadership Greater Chicago. And that's all about civic leadership and how we can have greater impact within our region. So I'm still very much engaged in those organizations. So it's about 50% of the time. Um, and I do look at how do I ensure that I have enough what I call white space on my calendar where I can dream still big dreams, things that I want to achieve and do personally 
in life. So making sure of that. And as I often tell people, no is a complete sentence. So when I'm asked to do things, I practice what I preach. I say no, I say it with love. Uh, or if I can perhaps offer something in another way through another person, I do that as well. Do you care to share any of those big dreams with us? <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I've begun work on a book that I started 10 years ago, but because of time and professional commitments, personal commitments, I wasn't able to fully devote myself to, you know, the discipline of writing, what yeah. it takes. And then the other part of it was, you know, struggling with myself. Everybody writes a book, you know, what's going to be different about your book, Connie? And, you know, who says that you need to write a book and that sort of thing. So I dealt with the self-doubt, continued to pour little things into my book, but decided in, in rewirement that now was the time to give birth to that. I do lots of public speaking and have done so mm -hmm. throughout my career. And there are little bits of those talks and questions that I get from individuals that have convinced me that it is my time to um, put those words on paper and share them with a broader audience. I love it. I will look forward to that book for sure. Thank you. What other things did you do to prepare for your rewirement? You presumably knew when your exit date was going to be from Northern Trust and what kinds of other things did you put in place or have you explored or what's been your process to kind of really enjoy this time of life? Actually, I wasn't as rigid to say, you know, this is the day that I plan to retire from Northern Trust and, you know, start the little countdown clock that people have. <laughs> um, I, you know, I tend to be a person who I, I, I pull things together in a way um, that allows me to look broadly, to widen the aperture and think more broadly about any decision. What I was clear about was, yes, this time would come. And so I did start planning 10 years ago, or even longer than that, because for me, the number one goal and issue in retirement was to make sure that I was financially secure. Yes. Right. That, that is so important because a lot of people, you know, that I've known and that I've seen, you want to retire because either they don't like the work they're doing, they, they want to pursue something else, but the financial grounding isn't there. And I'm not an entrepreneur at heart. I grew up uh, in a corporate setting. Uh, that is what I've always enjoyed. Certainly, you know, I know how to do different things to, you know, make money and so on, but that was not a driver for me. And so for me, the first was to get good sound financial advice. And working for the finest financial service company in the world, as I think about it, um, I had access to that information. And I've always been a very fastidious person in terms of saving and thinking about the long-term markets notwithstanding. So that was number mm -hmm. one. Number two was, who am I as a person? That identity piece that mm -hmm. I would often hear people, in, and usually it was men who really felt that once they retired, somehow their identity would be so dramatically changed. They so closely aligned themselves with their titles and their work that not having that part of their careers and their lives, you know, it's been, it's, it's difficult for some people. Fortunately for me, as I said before, you know, I've lived an undivided life. I knew that the corporation was not a human thing. It was the individuals within the organization that made my work pleasant and important to me. The corporation certainly, as it's defined as an entity, was important for identification, financial, and all that sort of thing. But I was always clear, Cara, about who I am as a person, that net worth is not the same as self-worth, and that I was put on this earth to do something, and that as long as I had breath in my body, the fun part of discovering that would be the journey and to share that as I moved through it. So as I thought about getting to that day in November of 2021, uh, when I announced and shared with um, uh, my CEO earlier that I was planning to rewire, um, it felt natural for me. And so um, I jokingly say to people, there was no identity theft when I left the firm because I'm Connie Lindsay and that's who I will be grateful for everything that I learned. And, you know, I had a good career. I had challenges. There were times when, you know, I thought, do I want to continue to do this work in this place? Um, I experienced all of the things that, or many of the things, but for me, you know, all of the isms that a woman of color would experience in the financial services industry, yeah. the, yes. the struggle of leadership and biases and all of that. 
Um, and I think that empowered me and drove me even more so to lift as I was climbing, to be as candid and authentic as I can with the mentees that I've had the privilege of coaching, sponsoring, and mentoring throughout my career and still do today. Um, to be real clear that once I was done, those experiences and stories were, eight, were, were things that I'd be able to share and perhaps encourage others as they're moving through. But it felt right. And after going through the pandemic, all of that, you know, just looking at you know, how soon do I want this to, or how much longer did I want to do um, work inside the corporation? Yeah, for sure. So I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal where gorgeous photos of you are featured. But it was all about these, and I, I've had a couple other guests on this podcast that have been participating in these Encore programs that are popping up at different universities around the country, Stanford, Harvard, and now University of Chicago. Is that something you're pursuing this fall? It is not. I was part of the advisory group, group okay. that helped develop the program. Um, Seth Green, who is the director and the, the founder over there, and I have known each other for a really long time. And he asked me if I would serve and work as an advisor as they were thinking about starting the program at University of Chicago, which is called the Leadership and Society Initiative. Yes. And so I was part of a broader group of people that were offering perspectives on how to make the program most meaningful for those individuals who would decide to participate in it. Um, I attended a couple of the pre planning sessions and, and was in very much engaged and still engaged uh, in that advisory capacity. Capacity, But that was one of the things that I chose not to pursue. Um, I think it's an amazing program. And for those yeah. who are going to part participate in it, it will be transformational. But for where I am right now, um, there are other ways that I'm doing similar things. And because yeah. I'm not in a place where I'm not um, able to articulate what I think my purpose is and to get to the resources that I need to continue doing that. That was not the choice that I made at this time, but I think it's an excellent program. I love the research, all of the information, and I've learned so much by aligning with them as an advisor. Very good. The question that I ask almost all my guests is what words of advice do you have for people who are nearing retirement? I'm always hesitant to give advice because it's always <laughs> it's so often limited by our own ability to see ourselves and our lives in a clear and proper perspective. But number one, certainly make sure that you have the financial plan, your, you know, your wealth plan, all of those things together and that you're clear about that and what matters to you. People have different levels of comfort with what number they need to be comfortable in order to retire. Everybody yeah. has, right? Everybody has a different number that they think about in their minds and actually as they look at their portfolio. So number one, think about where you're going to be financially. What lifestyle do you want to have? Do you want to take five trips a year or two trips a year? All of that. You know, what does that look like for you financially? And then I'd say the second is how do you, before you retire, I had a, a coach say to me once, you know, spend some time off work, take a vacation or a few days, when you're not working. And what does that day look like for you? From the time you wake up to the time that you go to bed, how are those hours filled? What are you doing? And if you had a month or a year or the rest of your life of days like that, what would that be like for you? So before we move into that retirement space, think about what your days are going to be like. Because as most people think, well, you're just sitting around and you're reading books and you're, you know, doing whatever it is, but it's not a lot of physical activity or whatever the case may be. You have to define that for yourself in the same way that I say to people, you define success for yourself. We have to craft a vision for our lives, post work, professional work or whatever that looks like, so that when we move into that season, we can still flourish that we are able to feel good about who we are, having a good circle of friends, you know, have a lot of deep, not a lot, but very meaningful, authentic, deep relationships with people that I love and who love me unconditionally and those individuals uh, who become friends over time. And there is a community to support this season and the next season. And then how do I think about my physical health, making mm -hmm. sure that I'm healthy enough to enjoy this time where I don't have to, you know, get up at a specific time every day to go and do something in an office or today in a remote work environment or a hybrid work environment. So 
physically, mm-hmm. how our, how are we taking care of ourselves, making sure that, you know, we have the body then to do all the fun things that lie before us. And for me, it's also for me, I'm, I'm a, a Christian. So for me, there is, mm-hmm. that is the foundation that informs everything that I do. So making sure that I do take the time to meditate, to pray, that stillness, that pause that allows me to just spend time being for all the years in corporate, you know, we were human doings at times. And I wanted to become that human being who could read a novel straight through, you know, and uh, be able to enjoy that, the, just the quiet times to, to be able to do that. I love that. And for somebody who didn't want to give advice, you just gave very good advice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, finally, I want to talk about another project that you have going on right now, which I went down the rabbit hole with. Um, you have, it's on Can TV and Spotify. It's a podcast slash TV mm-hmm. show called Joy in the Breakthrough. Yes. Tell us about that. So my co-host is uh, Anna Valencia. Mm-hmm. She's city clerk for the city of Chicago. Anna and I, Anna has been a mentee of mine for many years, and we have been talking about we talked about rewirement and she was saying, what are you doing, Connie? You do speeches, you still mentor people. We should think about doing a podcast. And just like with the book, there are millions of podcasts out there. You know, do I need to do a podcast? How do I, you're right, Cara. How do I, <laughs> here we are, <laughs> right here we are. And, and then I thought this would be fun. What do I have to lose? Um, I love talking to people and get, getting to know them. So our podcast, Joy in the Breakthrough, is an intergenerational conversation that we have with leaders who have um, been broken open to breakthrough, as we like to say, and we talk with them about their journey to joy. We ask them to define joy for us. And I say joy is an inside job. Happiness depends on what's happening, but joy is an inside job. It is it doesn't matter what's happening around me or to me, I can still maintain what I call internal equipoise. The ability to have that sense of peace and calm and connection with others, but not being so disturbed or moved by changes because we know life is constantly changing, challenges come our way. So on this podcast, Cara, we're talking to different people. We've had some amazing guests in our first season. We were asked to do a second season. So we are doing shows um, about that. You and I'll have to talk about perhaps you having a conversation with us as well. So um, yeah, and we are on Spotify, we're on Can TV, and um, other places where you find your, your podcast. So it's been a learning for me. The other thing was, you know, this is also on Can TV, which is public access television. Right. So it's live and it's, it's um, there is a visual there. And for me, it was like, I just want a podcast where I put on those cool headphones that people have (laughs) and that microphone and they have this conversation and all you can hear is their voice. And then you can, you know, think about what it might be like that you're talking about. And so with Can TV, there is a visual. So I do have to do hair and makeup to to move through that. But it's been a fun experience. Anna is a great co-host and um, we'll just see where it goes. Yeah, well, I love it. The show has a lot of really good energy and lots of little gems about how to live a purposeful life from what I've seen. So thank you you. for that. And thank you so much for being my guest today, Connie. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. This podcast is sponsored by Good Morning Freedom, my retirement coaching firm. I help executives and professionals plan the non-financial part of their retirement like how to discover new purpose and how you want to spend your time. I offer a one-on-one coaching retirement blueprint package where we work together to discover some new avenues of exploration for your Act 3. This coaching is completely custom and will provide you with a ton of resources and support as you transition to this new stage of life. For all the details, please go to goodmorningfreedom.com services.